Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for attending today's webinar. We're just going to leave it a couple more minutes to allow people to join the session, and then we'll start about two or three minutes past the top of the hour. Please stand by. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining today's webinar. We're just going to leave it two or three more minutes to allow people to join, and then we'll be starting the webinar. Please stand by. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. If you've just joined, we're going to leave it a minute or so longer to allow people to join the webinar, and then we'll be starting shortly. Please stand by. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining today's webinar, The Roles of Enterprise Architects in Innovation. Uh, my name is Will Scott with BizDesign, and uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you all here today. Uh, before I hand over to our presenter, Mark Langhorst, a couple of quick housekeeping notes. One, this session will be recorded, and the slides will be made available as well after the webinar. So after you after this webinar is finished, within about 24 hours, you will receive an email with a link to a recording of the webinar and also a link to the slides, which you can download as well. Feel free to share those with your colleagues as you see fit. Secondly, we will be taking questions at the end of this webinar. And in that respect, on your webinar, you can submit your questions via keyboard and at the end of the session, we'll get to as many of those questions as we can. If we can't get to them, we'll be following up with you separately via email. Uh, so with that said, it's my pleasure to introduce Mark Langhorst, uh, who will be talking to today's subject, the roles of enterprise architects in innovation. Mark, over to you. Yes, uh, thank you, Will. And uh, good afternoon to everybody on, the, on this side of the ocean. Uh, and uh, welcome to this webinar. A few words about myself so that you know who's talking to you. Uh, I'm Mark Langhorst, working with BizDesign as Managing Consultant and Chief Technology Evangelist. And uh, my main claim to fame, if, uh, if you could say that, is that I've been the manager of the development of the Archimate modeling language. So some of you might know about that. Um, today, I'm not really going to talk about modeling, although I will show examples of some models. Uh, but the presentation of today is about innovation and the role of architects in that. And a few words about BizDesign itself as an organization. We are a software company and we provide a platform that helps organizations in designing and realizing business change. And Gartner has qualified us uh, high up in the leader quadrants. This is the most recent leader quadrants uh, for 2019 that came out late last year. Uh, as you can see, we are way up there. Um, so if you ever need a tool, uh, just think of us. So far, uh, the commercial part of this presentation, um, but we are really going to talk about innovation and the role of architects in that. And to start with, I want to discuss our vision on change. And um, as some have said in the past, change will never be as slow again as it is today. 
Um, that is a frightening statement, perhaps change going ever faster, but it is reality. Uh, we have to deal with that. We have to cope with this fast pace of change. And um, well, famous quote from Charles Darwin is that it is about adaptability. It's not the strongest of species that survive. It's really the ones that can adapt to that fast pace of change. And that, of course, requires innovation. Um, one of the issues we see in change in organizations is that they, especially large organizations, uh, often have the habit of uh, thinking in terms of current state, then we do a large transformation, and then we are in a future state uh, that we can plan ahead of time. And actually, it doesn't really work that way. Because of this fast pace of, of, of change, you see that your current state is constantly in flux. So just capturing that is already difficult. Um, the future state is even more uncertain. Uh, it's a moving target. You can't say, well, we want to be there in five years' time. Uh, it doesn't work that way. You can aim for something, move a step in that direction, but then you have to recalibrate maybe a bit differently. And these big transformations that companies tend to plan, especially these large organizations, think in terms of big transformation programs, those are often just too slow to deliver because they try to do too much at the same time. Everything's connected to everything else. And that really slows down change. So what we need to do is improve the way we change. We need these continuous innovation and change capabilities uh, as an enterprise, rather than doing this separately in large transformation programs that are managed sort of outside the, uh, the, 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 the ongoing business, outside your concern. It just doesn't, doesn't work anymore. Um, so in a picture, this is what, what change used to look like. Um, really big step, uh, risky change that's painful, that's hard, that often fails, uh, because it is difficult in organizations that don't have the experience of changing faster. Uh, they wait too long to, to make necessary changes. And then when the necessity becomes too high, they have to do this kind of large painful transformation. But it would be much better if you were good at change and you can do it continuously. Then you can achieve the same effect with a lot, a lot less risk in smaller steps uh, by doing that continuously. That is what we aim for. But that also means that uh, in these organizations, lots of ways of change have to change uh, themselves. You have to become more adaptive as an organization. You can't delegate this to some department of change. This has to be ingrained in the whole organization. And my colleague Peter Matthijsen, our CTO, and I wrote a little booklet about this theme of the adaptive enterprise a while ago. And we recognize a number of different capabilities that such an enterprise needs to have. And I'm not going to discuss all of them today with you. The focus will be on the innovation, but let me just outline the others uh, briefly. Um, one of the main things in organizations is that they have become too complex. If you want to change fast, you have to simplify things. So that's one of the issues. Speeding up change itself is also something you need to look at. The process of change is often slow in organizations with lots of stage gates and approvals, et cetera. Decision-making needs to improve. Uh, for example, on prioritizing change, what are the important innovations? Which, uh, which opportunities do you really want to, to grasp? Collaboration is really important. It's not, like I said, it's not the department of change. This is something that is essential for the entire organization. So you have to involve lots of different people from lots of different areas of the organization working together on change. And then, of course, you still need to be in control. And especially in, for example, highly regulated environments, say in finance or in healthcare, uh, control is also very important. You can't just change and innovate in an uncontrolled way because you have to be compliant with all kinds of regulations. You have to be safe. Uh, it has to be secure. Now, in the middle, in the, the hole in the middle, we see a need for digitizing change as well because lots of organizations talk about digital transformation, and then they, they do the change itself in a classical old-fashioned way by making some, some PowerPoints, uh, drawing some figures on whiteboards, but the change itself also needs to be digitized. Well, that's, of course, the business we are in as, as business design. I'm not really going to focus on that. I want to focus on innovation today and the roles of architects in that innovation process. But first of all, I want to mention some challenges I see. Um, and especially in the architecture domain, of course, because that's what we're talking about. And one of the issues is that in some organizations, you really notice this culture of control. Um, lots of sign-offs and stage gates. People have to get approval for everything. And the 
classical architecture board is one of those roadblocks. Often they meet uh, once a month, they decide on compliance of project proposals, etc. Uh, and that just slows down uh, your, your innovation process. Uh, at a customer a few years ago, we once did the calculation how fast you could get approval for a project uh, to get through all the stage gates before you even started the project, just to get approval. You had to get 18 different sign-offs, uh, architecture just being one of them. And that took, in the best case, three months and a few days. And that was just best case to get your project started. And if one of these gates failed, you had to go back, wait for another month to get your approval. You can imagine that doesn't work if you want to innovate. Another problem that I see often in architecture is that there's quite an inward looking focus uh, of many architects. Um, often it's really about optimizing, making things better uh, rather than uh, so, so doing things better rather than doing the better things. It's really focused on optimization rather than innovation. And that inward focus also misses that many of these innovations are in the connection between your enterprise and the environment. Uh, and that ranges from new business models to new technology that you could apply. It's usually the surroundings of your enterprise that stimulate you to in innovate. And then also, if you innovate from the inside out, are the ones that should adopt your innovations. So it's always about looking at your environment, looking at the surroundings and not just looking inward. And then what I also see in organizations, especially in their IT landscape, over the, over the years, there has been a real focus on optimization for efficiency and cost. And it used to be that IT was a scarce resource. Um, you, should, you had to optimize for things like disk space, memory usage, etc. And that culture of optimization is still quite prevalent in architecture. And uh, people think, for example, that uh, storing data only once is a very good principle because that saves disk space. Well, now I'm exaggerating a bit, but you see those kinds of architecture principles, and sometimes there is a good reason behind them, and storing data only once can be a good thing because you avoid, for example, um, conflicting versions of the truth. But it also leads to situations where everybody needs to use the same shared system, and that removes all flexibility and opportunity for innovation. Like the example on the slide, if everybody has to use the same shared customer contact system, and if there's no way of deviating from that, what if some business unit wants to implement some novel customer journey that's really innovative that doesn't fit that shared system? It can't do it. So there has to be room for innovation as well. You can't just optimize only for efficiency and cost. Um, you, can't, uh, you, you can't really, um, let's say, uh, uh, earn great riches by only saving cost. There has to be some uh, external input there. So this forward-looking culture uh, that I mentioned, that's, that's quite important. Many architects are rather busy with looking at uh, their current state, uh, keeping their architectures up to date with what's happening around them. And that, I would say, is not architecture, but bookkeeping. As an architect, uh, you shouldn't be the human CMDB that keeps track of the current state and just uh, tries to keep uh, their models uh, in, in good shape. That's not really what architecting is about. Architecting is about giving direction. It's about the future. And of course, you can't give direction if you don't know where you're coming from. So there is value in keeping track of the current state, but it's not the most important thing you do as an architect. Really, that focus, this direction, that is where you should focus your attention. Um, so if you can, you should try to automate this, this current state capture. Uh, of course, there's lots of technology for that that can uh, harvest data from all kinds of sources, listen to your network for your applications, etc. So modern technology is really a help there. And you can just import that into your architecture to keep track of those kinds of changes, rather than manually trying to keep everything up to date. Now, when we're talking about innovation and the roles of architects in that, we see three main types of innovation that are uh, the types of roles that architects can have in innovation. And at the end of this presentation, we're also going to run a poll to ask you about your role in innovation. So please stay tuned and uh, uh, reply to that poll. And we'll get back to you uh, on these three at the end. But I will explain all three of them in more detail. Um, and that starts with architecting for innovation. Architecting for innovation, that means that as an architect, you're, you're responsible for making sure that innovation can happen. But what we see in many organizations is that things started, uh, well, 
started with this piecemeal growth with not enough control to keep down complexity. So many organizations uh, saw increasing complexity. And then this resource optimization that I mentioned that led to these large centralized systems that do it all. You have your large ERP system, for example, your large financial system, etc. But these systems are very difficult to change because of all these connections, all these uh, uh, relationships, this, this interconnectedness, uh, this complexity is a hurdle to change. Then we saw these waves of service orientation and agile development. Um, that helped. That increased local autonomy. Uh, scope was smaller than these large centralized systems. So that's, that speeds up change, uh, certainly in the short term. But you also see that this results in a web of all kinds of dependencies. If you know about microservice architecture, if you do that in the wrong way, you get a horrible, uh, complex web of, of interconnections basically externalizing the complexity that used to be in these large centralized systems. But we're also complex, you did, just didn't see it on the outside, but it's the same complexity. So we haven't really reached a state that's simpler, that makes it easier to change. You still have that complexity. So we're slowing ourselves down again because all these agile teams with their uh, microservices build their little agile silos and connect them in all sorts of ways that just makes life more complicated. So what we need to do as architects, when we're talking about architecting for innovation, is make sure that you architect for change. Future-proof solutions really don't exist. You can't design something that will still be the same in five years' time because the world around you changes. So the solution of today is not the solution of tomorrow. So future-proof is really a misnomer. You should think about how can we change something later? How can we architect in such a way that change later on is not going to be ridiculously difficult? Of course, uh, a short webinar can't go into the details of everything you can do as an architect, but I will just pick some, some ideas and show you some guidance on that. Um, so how do we do that? First of all, I mentioned complexity already a few times. You have to keep complexity in check. And complexity is really about the connections between the bits in your architecture, and the more of those you have, the worse it gets. And classical principles of architecture, architecture and uh, of software design uh, in general are still valid. Um, things like minimizing coupling and maximizing cohesion, those kinds of principles still help you to control your complexity. Uh, other things you can do is adapt the speed of change of different parts of your, your landscape, your IT landscape, your business landscape. Not everything needs to change at the same pace. Some areas are very innovative, need to get lots of freedom, uh, and you really let them run loose, basically. Other areas where I say regulatory compliance is really important, the speed of change necessarily has to be lower. But don't make that the speed of change of the whole organization. Create these different pace layers, for example, where different areas can change at their own pace, depending on uh, their needs and how they should be controlled. What you also need to consider is the different perspectives of architects. And here we are talking about inside out and inside in perspectives when you're architecting for change. Later on, I will uh, add two more perspectives to this, but we'll get to that later. So first of all, an example of an inside out perspective of an architect. Um, if you look at the business model canvas, quite a popular way of representing the business model of an enterprise uh, that starts basically with the value propositions of the enterprise in the middle. And here we are using an example from an energy company. Uh, later on, other pictures are also from that same uh, example case. And we see in the middle what kind of value propositions this company wants to offer to its environment, so inside out. And then you see what the activities are that support that, the resources they need for that, the relations with their different customer segments, the channels by which they offer their services, the partners they have, and the cost and revenue structure. That together gives the inside out view of that business model. What do we do as, a, as, a, as an enterprise for our customers and with our partners? Um, you can also look at more, in more detail at what you then actually produce in terms of uh, value creation. And this is a so-called business outcome journey map. Some of you might be familiar with the customer journey maps. I'll have one of those later on. But here we see how the company produces value overall. Here we see the, the overall value chain of the company different value propositions in stages of that value chain. For example, uh, in the uh, generate energy, they want to have uh, this, this value proposition, energy for a sustainable future, that was also on the previous slide. The, the goals and outcomes, they attach to that. And then a number of capabilities they need to provide this stage of their value chain. These capabilities themselves appear in this picture. And this is an inside-in picture. 
This is the capability map of this energy company. And here we have projected with colors the innovation readiness of these capabilities. So you can see some of them are really green, are really uh, ready for innovations. Other, uh, others say legal, for example, typically not the most innovative part of most companies, regulatory affairs, uh, finance. You see that they are not really a risk. Uh, they're not really innovation ready. It's not in their culture. It might not be in their systems. So there's an assessment behind this that looked at how easy would it be to innovate there? Well, you see the, the, the problem areas. So this gives an inside in look at what, uh, what areas as an architect you could focus on to improve innovation. Um, so that's yeah, looking, looking uh, at the inside. And an example of how you can help with making your company uh, more ready to innovate, making your IT landscape perhaps uh, more flexible, uh, is about standardization. Here we see how good standardization can support innovation. And this is an, an example from uh, another company. This is from, from uh, as you can see, from insurance, not from energy. But you see that this company offers different types of insurance products, uh, but has standardized the steps in the process, in this case of uh, claim handling. They, all the steps are the same. The phases in the process are always the same. Registering a claim, accepting it, adjudicating it, and paying. There's crosswise variation because they have different steps for the different products, but the, the sequence is always the same. So if there's a new product they want to innovate in, in their product portfolio, they can easily look at the existing steps and say, well, for this new insurance product, we can maybe take the registration step from the life insurance, and maybe uh, the acceptance from, from the auto insurance and tweak that a bit, and then maybe adjudication from, from healthcare, tweak that a bit, and payment might be the same for all of them. So there you see how, how innovation can be helped by standardizing these steps. What you should not do is this. This is bad standardization. This harms innovation. Here you have the one big registration step for all your claims. That means that all the business rules for, say, checking completeness, et cetera, should be in that one big step. Same for acceptance and adjudication. This might be the worst, because this is where the, the technical business rules come in about the value of what's, uh, what's being claimed, et cetera. You don't want to do that in one big step or with one big system that tries to do it all. It might not be the right solution. And if you add a new insurance product to this architecture, you can imagine how complicated that is. You have to weave it in these big steps, extend them with the rules for your specific uh, extra insurance product. So standardization sometimes is good, sometimes it is bad for innovation. So this is one example where architectural decisions really influence how easy or difficult it will be in the future to change things, to innovate. So this is about architecting for innovation, making sure that your architectures support innovation uh, and don't make things more complex than needed. Uh, you should really look at what are the areas in which we can expect change and build in flexibility there, not try to over-optimize everything for, say, resource uh, consumption, uh, cost, etc. But make sure that you keep the, the areas flexible where you could reasonably expect things to change in the future. So that was the first kind of role that architects can have. The second one is about coordinating innovation. And architects are relatively unique in, in, in their organization. And we'll get to that because coordinating is also difficult. And if you look at innovation success, um, there's a link behind this that you can uh, look up if you download the slides later on. Um, if you look at how successful innovative companies are, almost two thirds of venture capital financed uh, uh, startups lost money for their investors and only 4% generated more than 10 times ROI. So you can see that it is quite difficult to innovate. And one big issue here is scaling innovations. And most of these startup fa startups fail in the, in the phase where they need to scale up. So coming up with an innovative idea is not really the complicated thing here is making it work in practice in the large. That is really the challenge. And that is where architecture can really add value. Because the key issue here is that if you want to scale up innovation, you, lots of things have to move in the same direction. All these different parts of a large enterprise that have to move in unison to make this a success, that's really the big issue. And you have to make sure that everything works together. This coordination, that is something that architects can really help with. Because there are not that many people in an enterprise that have this broad overview of how the bits are connected. 
most people are specialists. They know about a specific area of the, of the business and they know all the details there. Enterprise architects are really more, gen well, they, they are sort of generalists with, with a specialism. They have this T-shaped profile where they have this broad overview of how bits are connected. And often they know specifics about uh, some areas, but they can see how the things uh, could be coordinated. What, what parts of the enterprise need to move if you uh, turn the knobs a bit to the right in some areas. So this is uh, another kind of uh, role that architect can have, this, this, this coordination. And one important part of that is relating these innovations to your business strategy. Um, uncoordinated innovation where everybody's just uh, having nice ideas and implementing them without understanding how that relates to where the business wants to go, that's, that's often also a problem in organizations. Lots of ideas that don't really result into uh, too much benefit for the, for the enterprise. Um, and that doesn't mean that you should only innovate top down. Uh, already in the early 80s, Minsberg and Waters wrote an, influence, an influential paper on this. We're talking about deliberate and emerging uh, emergent strategy. Deliberate strategy, that's the top down kind where you say, well, the, we want to go into this market with that product, uh, these customers, this is uh, top down what we want to do. Emergent strategy is also important. Half of the strategic change comes from the bottom up. Somebody on the shop floor has a great idea uh, that really has a strategic impact uh, on the organization. And in today's software-driven enterprises, we see that more and more because it's relatively easy to make fast changes to software. And you can innovate much faster, also bottom-up, from, from people that have great ideas uh, that fit with where the company wants to take uh, itself. So it just, well, it, of course, it, it needs to fit your business in, in some way, but you can do this bottom-up as well. But to really make that connection, you need a kind of portfolio management of innovative ideas. Um, it's like project portfolio management, but actually it's sort of a step before that. Before you really start projects, you have to think about the collection of ideas that, uh, that you're managing. Um, and it's like portfolio management also in a financial sense. You want to evaluate the different ideas uh, on different aspects and create a good mix of uh, ideas that have some have a long-term character, some have a short-term character, some are low risk, some are high risk, um, but you can evaluate them on um, aspects like, say, desirability. Is there somebody who really wants this? Feasibility. Can we build this? Can we actually do this? Strategic fit, like I mentioned, that should match with, with your strategy in, in, in some way. Uh, viability. Is it economically viable? Say, cost versus revenue. Uh, risk. Can we, can we actually sustain the risk? So you should have a portfolio uh, of ideas that has a, has a healthy mix. Like a portfolio of investments should be a healthy mix of low risk, low yield and high risk, high yield. The same idea applies here. Now here we see um, three portfolios. Uh, this is from our tool, how we, how we uh, manage that, but that's not really the important part here. But we see three portfolios related to three main strategic, uh, uh, strategic goals. Revenue growth, customer satisfaction and improved safety. And this is my, my energy example again. We see a number of metrics that we use to, to evaluate these ideas. We have a set of, well, set of ideas with different populations, uh, and then we can create dashboards out of that and compare these ideas and decide where we want to invest so that we have a healthy set of ideas in our portfolios. Um, oh, oops, uh, there's something strange happening. Um, this is another thing that uh, an architect can do. This is, oh, this, this, slide, this slide should have been moved. This is about inside in architecture. Um, this is still part of the architecting for change, um, architecting for innovation, where you could make your different business capabilities more autonomous by giving them their own data and giving them their own applications and letting them connect through services, a nice service architecture between. This comes from Roger Sessions and his blog, Simple Architecture for Complex Enterprises. Um, the idea here is that you make different bits of the enterprise more autonomous so they can innovate at their own pace. You're, you don't want everything connected so that everything has to move if somebody has a great idea. Um, back to where we, uh, we are, coordinating innovation. Um, I mentioned these innovation portfolios. And here we see an example of innovation scenarios looking at how certain innovative ideas um, are evaluated. Here we see a number of these 
metrics again. So things like desirability and viability, etc. Um, we see how certain scenarios could play out. Uh, here we have a scenario called Go Green with two uh, sort of opposite scenarios. One is the prosumerization, where you have uh, semi-professional providers of solar energy, and here we have everybody has solar panels on their roof. Uh, and then we see a number of different uh, aspects, the customer segments from our business model, technology, cost and revenue model, and we see how the different aspects are uh, evaluated. So for example, we see that uh, for safety first, this scenario, uh, the innovation is about having a digital twin of your company to do security analysis. Um, and then you see that, well, most customer segments don't really care about this. Um, the technology might be, well, sort of okay. The viability is still a problem, also in the customer segment part, because yeah, apparently this is uh, not so easy to set up. Um, well, and here we see some cost and revenue assessment. On the right, we see the impact on the three main strategic goals of the company: the uh, revenue growth, the customer satisfaction, and the improved safety. Uh, so these kinds of dashboards uh, help decision makers uh, to to see which innovations could be helpful and how they relate to their strategic goals, what the impact would be. So this is really about this coordinating role of architects, fitting the bits together. Um, I already showed you a capability heat map, um, but let's talk a bit more about capabilities, capability maps, because I use them a lot and I see them a lot uh, as an instrument for this coordination, because it's uh, a capability map is the place where lots of things come together. People uh, recognize the names of these capabilities. They understand that that is how their business operates. That's what they do. So it becomes a kind of backdrop to project all kinds of information on top of. And in that way, it becomes the connective tissue between all kinds of uh, depictions and analyses of the enterprise. Um, and uh, for example, and I'll show an example in the next slide, um, you can link your capabilities with the strategic goals of the enterprise. So see which capabilities really are key to your strategy are really supporting that. Uh, and you could compare that with how many innovative ideas you have for these different capabilities to improve these capabilities. And is that aligned or not? So are you innovating where it's really strategically important? Now in this picture, we'll see that that's not always the case. Uh, let me zoom in a bit uh, because this is uh, a bit too small perhaps. Here we see in colors, we see the uh, number of these different strategic goals, uh, so the revenue growth and the safety, etc. that's with colors. And we see with these numbers, the number of innovative ideas. And one of the things that's immediately apparent that we have lots of ideas in this asset design and engineering capability. And you can imagine how that is, right? You have all these smart engineers uh, responsible for these assets, and they have lots of, lots of fancy, smart ideas. But actually, this is not really a strategic area of the company. On the other hand, we see that customer service and customer analytics and customer programs, this is really where we want to have this revenue growth. This is where you have to call marketing customers. But we don't really have that many innovative ideas. So here you can see that there's a potential disconnect between the innovative uh, ideas that, that people come up with versus the strategic needs for innovation in the company. Now, this is important information, of course, also for that portfolio management of ideas. Uh, you don't want to fund all these 23 ideas in asset design and engineering if this is not a strategic capability. Maybe a few of them could be, but certainly not all 23 of them. Uh, and you might want to have some extra uh, innovation program to do something about the lack of innovation on the customer side. So this helps you uh, steer the innovation in the organization, coordinate uh, how that how that operates. Yeah, there you go. Um, well, you can do all kinds of dashboards uh, on this. You can you can show, uh, say, desirability versus feasibility of an innovation, and then the strategic fit with the size, and then adaptability if, if things change with the color, or maybe the risk of the innovation with color. That might also be a nice one, but just to show uh, what the the potential fit of these uh, innovations is. Developing these kinds of dashboards, you can do in all kinds of well, different different kinds of ways. But uh, in our experience, it's really helpful. As a way of condensing this this information from architecture and portfolio management in uh, in, in one in one small picture. Uh, behind this, of course, there's a whole wealth of information because all these programs will be connected to bits of the architecture, to the strategic goals. Um, things like feasibility are typically assessed by looking at 
if if this is really possible can we do that can we build that do we have the resources do we have the system all sorts of stuff you can find in the architecture all sorts of information that is typically captured in the architecture itself impact of change is something you can uh, easily well easily well, with some effort of course assess using your architecture without architects large organizations would probably not be able to do this uh, i think architecture is really a crucial discipline here uh, just to to make sure that these innovations are feasible that you can see how things would operate and uh, that you have an idea whether we can we can do this or not that's really crucial so that was the second type of role then we have the third type of role initiating innovation and this is the the the, the most forward looking you could say um architects uh, have this deep knowledge of this combination of, of business and IT. Enterprise architects are really on the boundary of these two disciplines. So they can, with this inside in and inside out perspective that I just mentioned, they can assess things like feasibility and risk, create uh, room for innovation, but they can also look from the outside in and from the outside out perspectives. Um, and from those pers perspectives, initiate innovations uh, that come from from outside the organization bring things uh, into the enterprise um, and uh, that way they 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 are more the starting point for innovation so um, that's that's certainly uh, one role and architects are also let's say relatively uh, rational people and this uh, shiny object syndrome that you often see in management is also something that uh, architects could uh, perhaps uh, counter a bit. Uh, the idea that every new technology should be uh, uh, adopted, of course, uh, a smart architect will say, hmm, yeah, this one will fit, that one, maybe not so much. So architects helping decide what innovations uh, are going to be done, uh, seeing where, where they could, uh, could uh, add value. And one example, again, in this energy uh, domain, here we see an outside out view of uh, of the energy world, a whole ecosystem, and we're talking about this energy provider in the in the center. This is actually the company we're, we're talking about. They have the energy provider role. But we see that energy is produced, uh, traded. We see the, the grid operators, and we have the consumers here. But there's one major change coming, and that is that more and more uh, customers, private and corporate customers, uh, are now uh, producing their own energy, solar panels on your roof, for example. So what we also see is that there is a new player entering this market, a peer-to-peer -peer platform provider that can directly connect these private and corporate customers to trade energy directly between them. So here you see that some of the payments now go over here. And if this grows, look at what the, the payments are going to do, you see that more and more might become a peer-to-peer -peer exchange rather than via these energy providers. So this might be a threat to their business model. This is an outside out perspective on the kind of change you could expect, and this could be something that this company would, would uh, take as an input to their strategic choices. Maybe start their own platform provider, this, this peer to peer role. Maybe they want to do that or in another way, uh, support their customers. And um, there are all sorts of ways you could use this kind of uh, external perspective to help, um, yeah, to help your organization innovate. Here we see. Um, a smaller scale, also external perspective from the outside in. And here we see a customer journey map. And that's typically the view that the customer has on how they interact with your company. So that's from the outside looking in. And here it's about, uh, in this case, uh, solar panels. Uh, customer wants to have solar panels uh, on the roof. Uh, you see the different phases, orientation, invest, install, etc. You see the different, uh, different channels. So we have the installer company putting the things on their roof. You have the website stores and all sorts of channels um, and this this perspective helps the organization to understand where the customer is happy or not and you see that the customer in the end is happy uh, the trading part where they make money from the solar panels on the roof because they, they produce energy but they are not so happy at the start so for example the website is a pain point the customer is not happy could be that this is then the reason to innovate on that side maybe you should develop a nice app for that uh, or improve your website or in another way maybe integrate with some some external information providers you can you can think of all kinds of ways of improving the customer experience on this side certainly an area where architects could also play a role so seeing this as an architect you could say hmm 
uh, this doesn't seem to work well. What's what's wrong here? Oh, you have the right information. The website's uh, unclear or technically uh, not good enough. Uh, or is, uh, is the customer just looking in other places for this information? How should we improve that? And of course, this holds for all the other steps as well. As an architect, you have this overview of these connections. You know what's behind all this, uh, all, the, all these steps. You know that behind this, there might be some, you know, some business process that takes a lot of time, or uh, a call center that doesn't have enough capacity, or all sorts of things that you, you could know as an architect that could improve that. Process. Another picture here, uh, it's about trend spotting. Um, architects can also see how trends could impact their organization. And here we have a simple dashboard that shows uh, for the Internet of Things as a main technology trend, which of their capabilities, which of their uh, uh, business actors, and which of their uh, other innovative ideas could be related to this generic trend. For example, uh, an innovation about uh, safety monitoring using IoT, that's certainly related to that. Uh, certain certain capabilities would be improved on that. Say the asset operations, if you know where all your assets are because you can track them, uh, because they, they provide celerity data, etc. You can, you can imagine how that improves the asset operation capability, etc. So trend spotting and seeing the impact of trends uh, and how they could uh, improve the operation of your company, create some say innovative products, uh, all kinds of improvements. That's really uh, the third kind of role. Now, um, in conclusion, before we go to the poll, um, I want to repeat that we really need to improve the way we change. Change is just uh, yeah, it's too slow for many organizations. Change needs to change. And that means that we need to improve the innovation process in organizations. And architects really are key to that. Uh, we see three different roles for architects architecting for innovation really making sure that things don't become too complex, making room for innovation, uh, helping people decide where things should change faster, where they can change slower. That's really the, the, the first role. The second role, coordinating innovation. That's because architects know how the bits fit together. They can see what the impact of X is on Y. What happens if you change something over here to uh, the pain points over there? They have this broad overview, whereas many, many people in the organization will have this specialist view of things, uh, only see their own little silo, they don't see the big picture. And finally, initiating innovation. Architects really have this overview of what could be the impact of innovations, how could they, how could they be used fruitfully, uh, and how, uh, how they, can, they can really uh, have a good effect in the organization itself. So things like trend spotting, uh, that's really a, a role for architects as well. So starting innovation, Coming with these ideas, showing what they could, uh, what they could be. Um, so that's the third role. Now uh, I showed a lot of models here. I, I said at the beginning I don't want to talk too much about argument models, but models as as an instrument are really helpful for this because they show how the bits are connected. And for all these three roles, I think that's that's quite crucial. Architecture for innovation certainly how to design things so that they're easy to change, how to control complexity, coordinating innovation. How the bits are connected, what happens if, uh, if things change in one place uh, to uh, areas elsewhere. And finally, initiating innovation to see what the impact of an innovation could be. Of course, this also helps you make these assessments. I think things like impact of change analysis, it's really crucial to have good models of your enterprise. Um, now, that was the main part of the presentation. Now, I want to ask your input. We're going to run a poll. Um, so, uh, Will, could you start the poll, please? Yeah, it's launched now, uh, so you should see a quick poll in front of you, um, which asks, what is your role in innovation? Okay. Uh, let's wait so for people uh, to fill in the poll for a bit. Uh, I guess you can see the results come in. Polling in progress, collecting responses. 2% have voted. So folks, if you can take the time, just uh, click on the answers. And, so what's uh, your main role in innovation? What's the important, uh, maybe you have multiple roles, but what's the main, the most important role you play in innovation as an architect? Okay. The poll results are coming in. 55% have voted. Ah, good. Looks pretty clear what the splits are.
So it seems to have steadied out. Uh, Mark, would you like the results? Yeah, let's let's uh, let's show the results. I don't know if you can show them or that because I don't see the poll uh, myself because I'm a presenter. No, I, I'm you... seeing the results here. So I, I, I'm seeing the results okay. here. So I'll just tell you the results are. So yeah. uh, the response is 40% uh, are architecting for innovation, 29% coordinating innovation, 15% initiating innovation, and 15% no role in innovation. Okay. Okay. Well, it is it is approximately what I would expect, and you can see that also from the order in which I put these these three, uh, I see most architects certainly busy with with architecting for innovation, coordinating a bit less, and indeed initiating innovation, uh, not so frequently. And none of the above. And maybe we missed some kinds of roles. If people have an idea about uh, other roles, uh, you can put them in the in the in the, in the questions, perhaps. Um, but yeah, I also see architects that are, like I said at the beginning, that are really busy keeping track of the current state and don't really have time for the future. So they might not have a role in innovation at all. Uh, yeah, that could, could also happen. It's, I think it's a pity because of the, um, the richness of the knowledge that architects have and what they can contribute. Yeah, but if you're really pressed with uh, keeping track of uh, everything that happens today, it's difficult uh, to look at what's going to happen tomorrow. Right. Um, well, thanks for your input. Um, before we go to the questions, one final slide. Um, this one, um, I hope you can see my slides again because it was telling me that while the poll was showing, it didn't show my slides. Um, but I think that should be uh, should be back now. Um, the first link here is to that little booklet I mentioned about the capabilities of adaptive enterprises. And the second one goes to our uh, website and specifically to the blogs we've written on innovation. Um, some of the topics I was addressing today also appear in uh, a series of blogs that we've written recently together. Well, I, I wrote those together with my colleague uh, Matthijs Scholten, uh, who's our innovation manager. Um, so, uh, more on innovation on the website. Right. Um, time for some questions, perhaps. Over to Will. Yes, Mark. Happy to do that. Lots of questions coming in. Uh, if we, again, if we don't get to them all, we will follow up with you separately. And again, just so everyone knows, we will be distributing a recording of this webinar and the slides that Mark used within about 24 hours of today's event. So Mark, I'm going to try and collapse a couple of these questions because some of them are thematically the same. The first one is, I'm going to put two together. What's the best way to influence upper management that an innovation strategy is needed for an organization to grow? And how do architects get a seat at the table? Yeah, oh, the seat at the table. That's maybe the, one of the most asked questions overall, and there's yeah, there's no easy answer to that. But in general, what 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 gets you a seat at the table is showing value. It's not by asking for that seat. It's by showing results that help people make better decisions. So proactively coming up with um, I don't know some dashboards that give an idea of well, where innovations have been successful in the past and where not. Uh, Based on the architecture models that I see, or architectures in general, often by adding data to that, you can provide lots of additional information to management that they couldn't correlate. The models plus the data give you new insights that you might not have otherwise. Um, one of our customers uh, over the years, uh, uh, maybe over five or six years, they kept adding especially financial information to the data they had, that the architectures they had, on their application landscape, and that eventually became a strategic tool in uh, the transformation of the company. And it's it's been sold twice now. Uh, insurance company sold twice uh, in a row in, in three or four years' time. And uh, in that that process of selling it, integrating it with a new company, all that data became really crucial. So the combination of, of architectures and information about how things could change and how, they, or how things could be improved, plus adding all sorts of data. They created dashboards out of that. Management saw that and said, oh, if you can do this, please, can you do that as well? Uh, come, come to talk to me uh, tomorrow. So it's creating your own demand by showing these kinds of results. Don't wait in your room until they come and ask. Really go out, show stuff. Uh, and sometimes people, well, Sometimes it's, it, it misses the mark, but at least you're out there, and uh, that that also gives you the feedback that helps you tune your results and helps you select what works and what not. 
Uh, they have no general recipe. It depends very much on the kind of management you have, how you, how to approach them, what kind of uh, what kind of style you should should have. But in general, show results rather than wait for questions. Okay, thanks, Mark. Here's another somewhat related question. But when organisations have an existing innovation centre of excellence, i.e., an organisational component that already thinks about innovation as a separate team, um, what is the uh, uh, best practices uh, for, or when do architects play a role with that team at what stage of the innovation life cycle? So I guess, how do enterprise architects intersect with an existing innovation center of excellence, if there is one? Yeah, well, if you have that, um, it's, it's uh, well, it, it, it could be a benefit, but it could also be dangerous because then people say, well, we don't innovate, we have people for that. That's our innovation center, and that's the dangerous thing. But if you want to involve, be involved in that, one of the, the, the good ways to start is to show that you can, with your architectures, help them decide how, what the impact of an innovation could be, uh, how feasible it is, because that requires all that knowledge about how things are connected. Uh, from there, you could then maybe expand your role into, uh, on the one hand, this. So basically, that's the coordinating innovation I'm talking about, how things are connected. But you could also expand your role in into the architecting for innovation because the innovators might know where they expect changes. So as an architect, you can then help uh, create the, the right environment for those changes. And perhaps you could get a role into uh, in, in this initiating innovations because you are in, in a conversation with them. And if you have a good idea that might fit uh, the, the, say the bigger innovation portfolio of, of that department, um, if you're in, in touch with them, that's, well, that's, that's the way to get your innovative ideas uh, heard. So I would start from the perspective of this coordination, helping them see what the impact of changes would be, how bits are connected, so that they are better prepared in deciding about innovation, and you could expand your role from there. Great. Okay, we've got um, one last, uh, I think we'll finish this question. Um, um, and basically, what we're being asked here is, uh, do, do we think about technology and uh, business innovation differently or are abstractly the way we deal with innovation in either of those areas, is it the same, i.e. you've got to architect, coordinate and initiate, or is there any meaningful differences in innovation when you compare business to technology? Yeah, I think the difference is more in the kinds of architects that do the innovation. You have business architects that are really on the, uh, more in the business innovation. Uh, but they, they will all have these three roles as well. Uh, same for technology architects. They might be more on the, on, the, on the side of technology innovation. What can you do with, say, Internet of Things, that, that kind of thing. But you still have these three roles. Um, architecting for innovation on your, uh, in your business architecture, that's basically what I what was talking about, these autonomous business capabilities. That starts from your business architecture. But architecting for innovation on the technology side might mean that you have to say to pick the right standards so that it is easy to swap out certain bits of technology rather than having all sorts of uh, customized homegrown stuff that makes it very difficult to change. So you, you see the same kinds of uh, roles, but in different domains. So the roles I would say um, apply to all architects, but the domain in which they apply, yeah, that differs from architect to architect. Okay, well, Mark, thank you so much for your time today, and thank you to everyone for taking the time to join the webinar. Again, we'll be sending out a recording and a link to the slides Mark used. Uh, if we didn't get to your question, we will be following up with you. Um, so again, Mark, thank you for your time, and I hope everyone has a great day today. Thank you. Bye now. Thank you. Bye.